All right. Well, I think we're live. And I don't usually start these things ahead of the schedule. So here we are at two, like on the dot, and hoping that I'm going to see some folks here today. That'd be great. Uh, it's a big subject today. Uh, hi, Sasha. Great to see you. And nice to have folks checking in from Germany. And um, hopefully we'll see some more. Oh, yeah. And from Austria as well. Hi, Angelica. It's great to see you. Uh, the more the merrier. So if you know anyone who you think might be interested in these uh, live streams, by all means, please let them know. Send along the link. And uh, the more the merrier. Um, really big subject today. When I say big subject, uh, there's some simple ideas uh, around this subject, but um, <laughs> uh, it seems to be very confusing because there are so many different colors, so maybe that's the confusing part. It took me a little while to figure out how to try and simplify this subject, so anyhow, we'll get into it. Uh, nice to see you, Rita. Nice to see you, Jerry. You guys are all saying hi to each other. This is great. Sweden is here. Daniela, thanks for joining. Uh, when I went to art school, uh, I skipped the first year. Uh, it's a long story. But anyhow, I got in on an advanced standing because I had a, a decent portfolio from my high school. And so... I was really fortunate because I really couldn't afford to go to art school for four years uh, at the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. It was expensive, but well, probably still is expensive, relatively speaking. Uh, so I didn't really have a good foundation year in color, and I didn't actually take a color course when I was at art college. So which which isn't really great you know really it's a good idea to actually take a color course if you're planning to paint uh when i think about it logically now of course when you're younger you're just full of ambition and you just want to get right into it and make some beautiful pictures so needless to say i kind of fumbled around while i was in art college and i guess i had some kind of a color sense um you know, I know if it didn't look right, but I couldn't exactly tell you why it didn't look right. And um, it's a very uh, frustrating thing to try and mix a color, and you're not sure where to begin. You, you know, over time, some experience might teach you that, well, if I use this color and that color, and I put those two together, I get this other color, which is close to what I want. But then you have to remember all the mixes that you've made. And um, unless you've worked out all your color charts, which is something I highly recommend, by the way, I recommend that you do color charts. Uh, some of you may know the artist. In fact, a few of you probably know the artist, Richard Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D. If you look him up, uh, and Ashley, if you look up Richard Schmidt, color charts online, you'll find a number of people who have actually done these charts uh, and they will go through the whole process and explain in detail what they did and they show off their color charts. Uh, and it's all very interesting. It's all very technical as well in a, in a way. But the premise of what they're showing is interesting because I'm going to attempt to show you some of this today so that you have in a sense, kind of a formula that you can follow uh, to, to make your color work. Now, I'm not going to show you uh, a way to, uh, when I say a formula, I guess I want you to be able to look at a color and at least be able to get close to it with some kind of logic. Um, I'm going to show you more than one way of creating color harmony. So harmony is this idea that when you put all of the colors together, they look right together. And that's a challenging thing 
because we have warm colors and cool colors, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And if we don't put those in the right places, that can be a real problem. And if we don't get the right values working, that can be a problem. In fact, that's a bigger problem. So I'm going to try and take you kind of a through, uh, through a step-by-step -step, uh, process, a way of thinking as you're working out your colors. And hopefully this will be helpful for you. I teach a comprehensive color course at the moment. Uh, through the Avenue Road Art School in Toronto. And in fact, uh, this coming term, if you were to go to the Avenue Road Arts School, uh, and you can find them online, you'll see uh, the color course there if anyone's interested in taking a comprehensive course where we actually work through all of these things uh, session by session. Be happy to see you there. I also teach private classes. So if anybody's interested in uh, uh, taking private classes, um, I'm more than happy to to uh, arrange that with you. Um, I have a few students now, and uh, it's really it's going well. And in fact, I also do very small groups. If you have like two or three friends that want to get together and uh, work together, it's kind of a community thing. At the Avenue Road Art School, it's the larger groups, and um, it's worked out well for that too. So. Um, that's my bit of advertising. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to take you to uh, this little setup right here. By the way, I got me uh, another camera. And this hopefully will stay in focus. The last time uh, everything was changing, when I, when I put my hand in front of it, it was autofocus. And, Everything was kind of getting fuzzy. So I hope this is a big improvement. Uh, it came to me the day after, uh, in fact, the evening uh, of last session. So I didn't have it for last session, and that was a bit frustrating. So you see I've set a few things up here. Um, I'm going to take you first through the colors that I'm going to use today. And this is by no means a, a comprehensive uh, color palette, but you could really use this palette alone and create literally thousands of uh, different colors out of the palette that I have here. Um, great, Sasha. I'm, I'm glad, you know, my hand should be out of focus and the rest of it stays in focus. This is good. I'm glad it's working. And hopefully this sounds okay too. I'm gradually investing in things that make this better because I realize if I'm really going to do this, then, you know, everyone's going to run away if it doesn't look good or it doesn't sound good. Um, okay, so I'm going to start, through, I'll just go through my colors here. You can see the tubes here. I'm working with old Holland paints with the exception of this one here, which is a Rublev. And you're going to see a Permelba white over here. Now, this is one that I love to paint with but it's not the white that I have out here. Um, the white that I have out here is an old Holland. In fact, I can show that to you. Uh, if that's in focus, I don't know. It, it's um, it's a zinc and uh, titanium mix, and it's just got a little more um, weight to it. It's a little heavier. The pigment's more in, uh, intense, even in the white. The Permelba is a much cheaper brand, I mean, price-wise, but it's a very good quality paint. And I can only get this from the U.S. I don't know if you can get it in Europe or not, but I love working with this. It's very buttery, and it's a little bit cooler than the old Holland white. So it's just a little more on the blue side, and the old Holland's just a little warmer, probably because it has a little bit more of the uh, zinc in it. I'm guessing they don't give you percentages of mixes, I don't think, on the tube. So uh, I'm using an ivory black extra. Uh, this is this is an old Holland ivory black extra. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you should stay away from black when you're working with color. But I want to use it today to show you a couple of things. So that's what we've got here. 
Then I've got the cobalt blue right here. Again, Old Holland. All of these are Old Holland. Uh, Lizarin uh, Crimson Lake. Uh, I've got Yellow Ochre Light. Sometimes I use a Yellow Ochre Dark. Um, just depends on what I'm painting. I just thought for today we could use that one. And then, of course, I've got the Old Holland Zinc Titanium Mix. It's a tube that cost me a good chunk of money. It's expensive, but it's beautiful paint. Then I've got uh, the Cadmium Yellow Deep um, over here. Again, Old Holland. Cadmium Red. Old Holland. And this one here is Ultramarine Blue uh, Light, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just check here. Uh, ultramarine Blue. Yeah, Light Extra is what they call it. I like the extra thing. I don't know what the extra stuff is. So there's an extra ivory black and an extra uh, ultramarine. Maybe they just put more pigment in. I'm not sure. Anyhow. Uh, great. The sound's good. Focus is good. This is great, Sasha. Thanks. I appreciate it. Nice to see you. Uh, I think I said hello to everyone. Rita, nice to see you. Petra, Sasha. I think I can even scroll back. Got everyone so far. Andrew Cole, nice to see you, Andrew. I don't want to miss anyone. Um, anyhow, so I'm just going to highlight me again. And just I just want to say that with all the information I give you today about color, there's one thing that's more important, uh, aside from your drawing and all of those other things. But the thing that is most important of all is the value. Now, when I talk about value, I'm talking about how dark or light something is. And if if you don't have one of these, a value, oh, uh, a grayscale, uh, you should get one. They're very handy. Uh, keeps you in, in line, sort of like, like a piano keyboard. You know, it's the, the rule book of values. Now, this has a 10 grayscale. I usually am okay with an 8 or 9 grayscale. That's fine. You can make your own if you want to, just by mixing black and white together and, and creating those values. Um, and what's nice is that when you have something like this, you can actually hold it up to the subject that's in front of you and or, or your reference and just make sure that when you squint, when you really squint down, because squinting down basically cuts down the color information and you start to see things more in a gray level, if that makes any sense. Uh, I know you could even wear sunglasses or something like that. that. That cuts down some of the color information too, but the problem is that it also decreases the values as you look at it. Mind you, if you were to hold the color or the value scale in front of a color and you have sunglasses and you don't see that color anymore, but you see it um, as a value that matches the one on your grayscale, at least that's right. Okay, so when you take your sunglasses off, then the value is right. So value takes precedent. If you don't get your values right, your painting's not going to hold together. There is an exception to this, and the exception is Impressionist paintings. Uh, if you look at Monet's paintings and you take a black and white photograph or you go online, look at his work, take a black and white photo of Monet's uh, uh, paintings and look at them in gray, you'll see that a lot of stuff is missing. Uh, you know, it doesn't, they don't hold together very well, but because his colors are working well with warm and cool and neutral colors, uh, his paintings are just so alive. So, you know, just when you think you can make a rule, you, there's a rule to break it. So, um, but what I want to talk about today has to do with value uh, for basic color mixing. And um, the other thing I want to say is that this whole idea of warm and cool is really confusing for, for a lot of folks. So, you know, what, what is a warm and cool color? Uh, I, I, I always use this example with my students uh, because I think it's just easier to understand. If I were to walk up to 
uh, a refrigerator and I open the freezer door and I put my hands up to that freezer door, uh, sorry, up to the uh, compartment. The front of my hands, my palms and my hands are gonna feel cool. But the back of my hands are going to feel relatively warmer. If I did the same thing with a fire, so I go up to a, a bonfire, campfire, and I put my hands towards that, the palms of my hand are gonna feel uh, warm and the back of my hands are going to feel relatively cooler and I'm always I like to use the word relatively uh, There's a rule with light and you can generally follow this rule and that is if the light is warm if You're looking at sunlight for example Then the shadows are going to be relatively cool because if you think about it, uh, the light that's coming from the sun, it's a very warm light. There's a lot of yellows and orange and those kinds of colors. That's a warm light if there's direct sunlight. So again, it's relative, right? So you've got relative, I'm holding my hands up to the sun right now. Well, not really, but let's pretend. And the palms of my hand are warm and the back of my hands are relatively cooler. The opposite is true. If it's a very cold day and you know you put your hands out the door, you get that cool wind blowing against the palms, the back of your hands are going to be relatively warmer. And so it is with light. So if you have a cool light, and cool light might be north light, for example, you're not in direct sunlight. Uh, cool light, maybe a diffused light so you've got like a really overcast day the sun's there but everything's towards the blue side there's no direct light hitting the subject then the shadows are going to be uh, are going to appear relatively warmer so it's really important to know which of your colors lean towards warm or cool and so what I've got set out here, and I'm just going to go back to this layout here. Um, I have my cool colors here. So I've got cobalt blue, which I call cool balt blue. It just makes me remember it easier because I'm simple. And a lizard crimson, which is a cooler red than cadmium red. Uh, that has a lot more heave in it, if you think about it. Um, this was something that leans more towards the violets. So um, just keep that in mind. I mean, these are just generalities, but this is a, a principle that I follow when I'm painting. Uh, yellow ochre, this one's really confusing for a lot of people because they think because it's yellow and it looks warm and it's an earth color, that that must be my warm yellow. But in fact, it's not. When you add white, to this color here and you add white to this color here and you can do this in your own time or maybe if we have time i'll do that for you today you'll see that that's the color that you want to use to paint sunshine that's not the color you want to use to paint sunshine so it's a cooler yellow relatively speaking when you look at the two like this the reds are obvious look how warm that is there that's cadmium red. So here I have our warm primary colors here. My cadmium yellow, cadmium red, and ultramarine blue. And ultramarine blue, again, leans more towards the reds on the violet side of uh, the uh, color wheel. And I kind of hate the color wheel because it's so confusing. If you take my classes or if you want to know more about this, I work with a system of triangles. And it's just much easier to remember in your head. Uh, I find the color wheel, and maybe it's just um, simple, but I find it confusing. And now you're talking, well, I'm talking about something that I didn't take a course on. So, you know, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, but I did read a lot of books. And every time I read uh, a color book, I just got more and more confused because there are so many different ideas around what makes good color and what's bad color. And, 
It's sort of like, you know, do you like strawberries or do you like bananas? Um, good color to me is something that has to work within the painting in the context of the subject and in the context of the other colors around. Um, and all of your colors should have this idea of harmony. So, you know, what is harmony in color? Harmony means that they get along with each other. So it's sort of like, you know, they're not fighting with each other. They're not sort of saying, hey, look at me. And the other one's saying, hey, look at me. And no, no, I'm, I'm going to fight with you. Um, this, this is really not good. So if you've got a painting, for example, with three primary colors in it at full strength, you could end up with a fight on your hands. They're all going to be yelling, saying, look at me. Even the blues can do that. That, you know, if it's full strength, if you have a full strength cobalt or ultramarine or thalo, I mean, thalo is just vicious. It's a terrible fighter. So it it's really a good idea to make sure that one color dominates, if possible, through your painting. And I'll explain how, how to get to that. The first thing I'm going to show you is... Since value is so important, I'm going to remove this here. Oh, I guess I have to take a clip out of the way here so that it doesn't all go flying. All right. Um, actually, what I can do, well, just before I do that, is I'm going to show you a, a couple of, well, three paintings here I'll show you that have a dominant color theme running through them. I'll just put this down here. This is one that I've shown on Facebook before. And you can see that the overall color feel to this painting is towards the blue side. Uh, I used the ultramarine blue and I happened to use a Rublev uh, paint which is like a uh, it's a Rublev. I'm just going to pull it up here. I believe I used a Rublev Cypress Burnt Umber, if I'm not mistaken, but I added blue into it. So the, the blue is my overall theme here. And the most intense colors, intense blues, are sort of in this area here, but even those have been muted a little bit with the Rublev because I wanted it to feel like it was a little bit of a cool overcast day with maybe a little pop of light coming through here and there. Um, and the only reason why that looks bright and light is because the value is lighter. So that's an example of a blue overall tone or color. Um, this is another one. And this is towards uh, the pinks in this here. Everything's on the fairly warm, when I say warm, pink, this is this was a cadmium red, and I added uh, white into it, which cools it down. So, so white lightens and it cools the color simultaneously. That's what it does. And this is a very muted palette. It's pretty much grays, you know. I've got a little bit of warmth in some of these grays, a little bit of cool in some of them. I've got a bit a bit of a blue going through overall, but this is not a really hot, warm scene. Uh, as compared to this one here, which is really lots of warm blues. So I'm into the manganese here, the thalo family here. And these greens, you can see they're fairly warm. There's quite a bit of yellow in there. A touch of cadmium yellow right in here, even a tiny touch of orange. And so you can see the difference between the overall mood there and the overall mood here. Uh, they're very, very different. And when you harmonize your colors, which we're going to talk about today, it gives you an opportunity to keep things cohesive. It gives you a chance to uh, decide which color you want to dominate. And... Um, uh, 
how you want your viewer to look at it. What is the mood that you're creating? Because color basically creates a mood. If your values are right, then you have a chance with your color to really put the icing on the cake. All right. Now, what I have out here uh, is when I go outside painting, if I'm doing some plein air painting, sometimes I'll do this. If I know it's going to be, you know, I'm going to be in a real hurry and I just want to get my values working uh, in a hurry. And I want to be able to mix my colors without getting all into all the complement colors, which is a whole other level of color theory. Um, I can take a grayscale, which is very simple. So this is the black. This is just a darker gray than my background. This is a middle gray here. Let's just say that's like a number five out of 10 or thereabouts. Um, and then I've got a gray that's slightly lighter than the middle gray. And I've got one even lighter again. And of course my white pops right out against uh, this background. So you can see that range. And if I want to paint something uh, when I'm on location and I want a quick guide or a quick way to get to uh, painting something that looks somewhat realistic on a value scale, this is, this is a way I can do it. Now, I'll take a color here. The easiest uh, way to show this is just to, I'm going to take a bit of cadmium red here. And I'm just going to put that down. You'll notice I'm painting with my palette knife. And by the way, I highly recommend that if you do color scales, and I recommend that you do them, that you use your palette knife because it gets you used to using your palette knife. I'm just going to create some kind of shape here. I'm going to create a round ball with a palette knife. That's ridiculous. But here we go. All right, so it's nice and bright. Um, I always have to, the other thing is you have to keep your palette and your palette knife and your brushes clean when you're doing these things. Now, if I want to darken this down, I'm looking at this and when I squint at it, I see that that red is darker even than that gray right there. So that's interesting. I'm going to just grab a darker gray and by the way, this works not too badly with red. Um, it doesn't work with other colors as well. Uh, <laughs> because typically the black uh, will have, if you're using an ivory black, which I quite like to use, ivory black has a lot of blue in it. And as soon as you put that into your yellows, they start to go green. So I'm just going to gently create a sense of value change here and I'm very softly working this color into the other you know I could use a brush but I want to keep it kind of chunky and fresh now there's an interesting little thing my boss used to say years ago you can't get any redder than red so why would he say that to me? Uh, and I'll just show you why. So if I'm trying to paint a red ball, uh, one of the things that we do, it's a huge mistake, is to grab, well, let's, let's just do it. I'll do it right on the ball. I'm going to grab some white. Well, why not? You know, we can make this lighter on this side. I'm going to have to grab a little more than that. That's one thing about old Holland paint. It's so intense. So what happens when I add white? I end up with pink. So it's no longer, you know, I could try and smooth that down. And the problem is what I end up with is a pink ball here and a red ball here and then sort of a gray looking something down here. So that's a little bit of an issue because I don't want a pink ball. I want a red ball. So let's just do that. I'm going to take this right out of here. It's the nice thing about this slippery surface I'm working on. 
I'm going to put that red right back in there. And you can see that intensity comes back again. All right, so there's my red ball. I'm going to bring that down a little further. Now, I want to create a more of a shadow side on this thing. It doesn't look like a ball yet, and I'm hoping it will when I'm done. I've already used that gray. I'm going to go into this uh, black, straight into black here, which might be a little too much. Now, one thing you don't want to do is lose the identity of your color. So you don't want to have a red ball that suddenly turns into a black ball on the other side. You want to feel like, well, this is like a shadow. So if it goes too black, then you just need to add a little more red into it. I'm working with oil paint. So of course that's a little easier because it's more forgiving and I can bring the value down. And this works particularly well with red, as I say, for all colors, it's not the same. Uh, now I'm gonna see if I can do this with a palette knife. I'm just gonna clean this around a little bit here on the side. Maybe what I should do is just grab a brush here just to clean up the side. So all I have here is just a, a brush with thinner in it. And I'm going to just take away the color around the side. And if it ends up being round, it'll be a miracle because I'm working underneath a camera that's getting in my way here. This camera is fairly low, as it turns out. I need little short brushes to do this. So it might look more like an egg than a ball. Okay, just clean that up there. So the the red is that I can get is is this red here because you can't add white. Because if I add white, I'm going to end up with pink. But I can do one thing. I can bring in a warmer color. So I'm going to, when I say warmer, I can bring in a lighter color that also is warm. So I'm going to go to my cadmium yellow here. And let's just see what happens when I do this. I'm just adding in this cadmium, and again, this is old Holland paint, so it's very rich. And I don't want it to be a yellow ball, but I want it to feel like there's light hitting. It's a little bit warm on that side of the ball. And you can see how that works. As I mix it in, it still looks like a red ball in warm light. That's what that looks like. If it doesn't look like that to you, then, well, it looks like that to me. Now, if I want to show some real contrast here uh, to show that this ball is actually located somewhere, I can put some dark behind it, and I'm just going to grab the black, and I'm being very simple with this. I'm just going to put some black behind it. And again, I'm working with a palette knife, so, you know, that's my excuse if it doesn't go very well. Keep practicing with your palette knives. Get better with it over time. So I'm just going around the outside of this. And you can see how dark that value is. Uh, when you consider that's like a solid black, we got pretty dark. And yet it still looks red in the shadow. So that's something that's pretty important. I haven't gotten into reflected light here. If I wanted to, let's just see if I can do this. If I want to bring, I'm using my finger here, see if I can pull it away a little bit, give a sense of reflected light. No, it's not working very well. So I'm not going to, well, you know, I can do it with a brush again. Let's see. Better grab the right brush. There we go. I don't know if this is going to work. It may be too slippery to do this effectively. Is 
just want to pull a little bit of the color up here and allow for a little bit of a lighter reflected side. Well, it sort of works. It's not great. Anyhow. Um, the reflected light, of course, depends on the surface that it's um, sitting on. So if this was sitting on a, a yellow surface, you'd have a yellow reflected light, but it would be darker in value in the shadow area here than it would be over here. So, you know, I could, if this is warm light, I could reach for my yellow ochre, which is the cool yellow, and I could put that in here, but I have to make sure that it is darker than that color over there. So when I squint at it, it shouldn't be lighter. It doesn't make sense for something that's in the shadow to be lighter than something that's in the light, does it? So I can do that. And if, of course, I was putting this on a an ochre background, so let me just pull that paint away. I'm going to go grab some ochre and put it down here. Then I may find that starts to make sense. Now, I'm not going to get into the shape of shadows and all that kind of stuff right now. Shape of the shadow should have something to do with the object, right? If I've got warm light hitting, then I need to actually have a bit of warmth hitting this area that's in the light. So I'm going to reach for my cadmium yellow here. You have to think through it sort of scientifically, if that makes any sense. I'm going to have a little bit of a warm light hitting this side. And the further away from the light you go, the less of that intense yellow color we'll see. Again, I'm doing this in a very simplistic way, but I just want you to get the idea of this principle. Warm light, cool shadow, and I'm just working with gray here. Okay, this is this is one way that you can get to something quite quickly. Ah, nice to see you, Isabel. Who else am I missing in that? Great to see you guys. So nice to see everyone. Thanks for showing up. And Christian Gray. Okay. Zeus Olympus. Welcome, welcome. Carl. Uh, this is so great. It's nice to see everyone checking in. And Sonia, too. Super, super great. Nice to see you guys. Um, okay, so I'm looking at this like you'd think I don't know how to draw a circle. Um, they're not as easy when you're working underneath a camera for some reason. I'm on an angle, and I'm making excuses right now, so I'm just going to just go in here, see if I can clean that up a little. So it looks a little bit more round the good thing is that I'm working on this canvas well it's not canvas it's a paper that is used for palette these gray palette papers are great by the way um, I just find it's easier for cleaning up and you also have a nice mid-range uh, to work against with your colors so you know where your middle grays are I'm going to go back now and just clean this up a little bit more. And again, when I head out towards that side, I can have a little warmer color showing. I have to remember I'm just doing a demo and not a painting here. I get too hung up on trying to make it look nice. But if it doesn't look nice, well, then I get all upset with myself. Maybe you'll be upset with me too. All right. Anyhow, you get the general idea here. Okay. Still not a perfect ball, but anyhow, there it is. Um, okay. So this is a, a, an example. Um, I want to do this with another color 
and just give you a sense of what happens using gray. And I'm going to use the yellow, the CAD yellow this time. And so this would be, a, a, well, it's a warm, again, it's a warm color. Maybe what I can do is put this into a cool light. Might be interesting. Okay, so, okay, this was a warm light. Let's do a, let's do a cool light over here. And again, I'm just using grays at this stage. Okay, so um, this is not really the way you get the really punchy colors, but it's a quick way. If you're painting outdoors or something, and you just want to quickly get your valleys to work, this is one way. But what you want to think about when you're painting good color is refraction. And I'm not going to get into all the theories of refraction. Uh, you can always read up on it. But the idea is that uh, the complement color gets introduced into the shadow areas, which neutralizes the color. So I'm just trying to show you simple ways to harmonize your color. So this is one way. So if I've got cool light, well, it gets interesting because this is a warm color, right? And if you remember a little earlier on, I told you that uh, white lightens a color and it cools a color simultaneously. So let's call this our cool side here. Imagine the light's coming from uh, this direction here. And the light here was coming from this direction. This is a warm light here coming from here, and this is going to be a cool light. And just to really accentuate that idea, that's a cool light coming from this side over here. All right. Warm light, cool light. Always keep that in mind. You know, um, if you turn the lights out, you can't see anything. So the color of light becomes quite important at a certain stage and you can't see anything without it. So I'm going to bring in white, which will cool the color and lighten it simultaneously. What I don't want it to look like is um, a ball that has no color in it. So let's just put a bit of a a little more light here and again I'm being really simple with this sometimes you can mix the complement color in here in a light area and it really pops the highlight but I won't get into that right now I just want to keep this simple for now so if I have cool light um, I would have warm shadow now when I look at this this overall is lighter than the gray background so I'm going to reach for, well, let's see what happens when I reach for this one here. This might be too light. I'm going to start to gray it down. You can see what happens there. It's, it's too light when I look at that. So I'm going to get rid of that. Good thing for slippery paper. Okay. I'm going to go back into my yellow. I'll replace that. Again, I'm not going to get too fussy with this. I just want you to get the idea. So that light one was too light. Let's go into something a little darker. And when you're painting on location, you know, you, you don't have a lot of time to fuss around and be changing your mind a lot. You just want to get it done. Now, the problem, you'll see something that happens here, is that when I start to add this gray, it starts to go towards the green side. Now, it's kind of fascinating to me because the uh, ivory black extra in Old Holland has less blue in it somehow. Because if I was using a Windsor Newton, uh, it, would, it would definitely show more green than what we're seeing right here. So I'm just going to keep going with this. I'm going to go into a darker uh, gray into this shadow area over here. 
and again with oil we can do these mixes because we've got a little time on our hands it takes a little while to dry and I'm doing this with a palette knife so it's just kind of chunky and you can see now we've got like a yellow ball that suddenly goes into a, a, a kind of a yucky greeny gray right and that doesn't work very well. I need to have more yellow showing here because if I don't, it's not going to look like a yellow ball anymore. So it's always keeping that balance when you're doing these things. Make sure that the original color of the ball doesn't disappear. It doesn't turn into uh, you know, a, a yellow ball that turns into a green ball on the other side. So I'm just adding more yellow in on top of this. I want to keep the color identity but I'm struggling because it's going quite green. So there's a solution to this. This is where the complement color comes in. Um, I'm going to add the complement color to green is red. Okay, so I've got cool light, warm shadow, relatively warm. I'm gonna bring in a touch of red to neutralize. I have to be careful how much because this is old Holland. A little goes a long way. Um, I'm going to bring that red into the shadow area so that it gets rid of that green. And because the old Holland red is so intense and so full of pigment, I need to go into this with more of the yellow. You can see how you can go through a lot of paint in this business. And you see how that appears green right there? Well, I need to have just a touch of the red in there to make sure that doesn't look green anymore. Doesn't take very much of that red to do that. Okay. Now, if you're painting a whole scene outside, you know, you're painting a still life. Well, if a still life you're painting then you've got some time you can work at this and you can really look for these things but when you're plein air painting outside you don't have a whole bunch of time the lights changing and people are bugging you and their kids hanging around and asking questions and saying like what are you doing are you an artist you know so you to get a lot of information down and keep your focus uh, with all the interruptions that can happen it's very challenging you can see I'm just adding more and more yellow into this. And now this is starting to feel like it's a ball that's turning, a yellow ball that's turning into a darker area. Um, I'm going to bring even more of that yellow in here. This really blast, let's keep it simple, through here. And because I've neutralized that color with the red, it doesn't look quite so green now. You can see it's starting to work better. It's like an impressionist ball. It's interesting. All right, now I'm going to throw in some dark color behind it. I'll just go with the black because it punches it out. And let's just do this. I'm just going to cheat here. And Grab some black and put this in with a brush. So it's kind of a an almost, it's an almost ball. It's one that won't roll very well. So I'm just going to go around this. There we go. Okay. And because it's cool light, um, I can use my yellow ochre straight here. And I'm going to go in here. That's a cool yellow right here. And I'm going to have my shadow in behind it. And I'm going to bring more light of course when i lighten a color with white it cools it and lightens it simultaneously get a little more ochre in here i 
and you can see how that feels. You look at that. It's a warm yellow ball sitting on a cool yellow surface in cool light. I could even, if I wanted, I could take the white and just bring a touch of the blue into it and put that behind, and that will still kind of hold. Okay? So there we have two different colors. And I've talked through the idea, the thinking as you go into these here. This was done with blacks and grays. Uh, the complement color, which is green to this, I didn't bring into this red ball, but this one I brought in, uh, well, the complement is actually uh, to yellow would be violet. So we haven't even gotten to that stage yet. I've just taken a, the cool yellow, brought it into, sorry, the a darker yellow. I've got cool light, warm shadow, but I brought down the value with the ochre and I brought the cadmium red in. Okay, so the cadmium red is your warmth, just to clarify that. Uh, this whole warm, cool thing can be just mind bending sometimes. And um, uh, sometimes what I'll do is do an entire painting in grays and in, in a value scale and that's something you'll see uh, Stefan do sometimes if you check it out um, and when it's dry you can create glazes over top of it uh, just for fun let's just see I hadn't planned to do this today maybe I shouldn't push it because I, I could show you how a glaze works over top of a painting. Maybe I'll do that for another session. Uh, okay. So that's one method, which is working with your grays. And I just want to show you now, I'm going to take this away and show you another way of working your color. I'm hoping all of this is making sense so far. Uh, question from Annette. Yes, the painting palette's a, a paper palette. It's a gray uh, uh, palette, paper, and it's it's called Gray Matters. I don't know where you are, but uh, this is something that's fairly common in the art stores now, and it's just called Gray Matters. It's um, a, palette a palette that's gray paper. It's really easy to get rid of it. You just throw it in the garbage when you're done. Or you take your leftover paint and put it on a canvas, which I'd prefer to do. And that way you've got a nice base to paint to later. As any of you who have been watching know, I hate throwing paint away. It's expensive to buy. And I hate filling landfills with expensive paint. So, you know, why do we do that? So just use that leftover paint, uh, put it on a canvas, make yourself a Gerhard Richter painting if you want to, and then paint something over top of it. And it's fun to do that way. It gives you some nice textures. All right. Isabel, nice to see you here. All right. So... What I'd like to do now is show you a little more comprehensive way of painting. Um, well, I guess the way nature works. You know, I showed you a representation that kind of imitates nature, but in fact, nature is a little different than what I've shown you here because everything doesn't go towards gray in nature. Um, we are working with refraction. And so looking at this warm and cool premise, I just want to talk about that for a little bit. And I, while I'm thinking about it, I just want to prove to you that yellow ochre is a cool yellow compared to cadmium yellow. I'm going to put them together here. And I'm going to add white. Remember when I, I told you that when you add white to a color, it lightens it and it cools it at the same time. So I'm going to just take the yellow ochre here. And there's my color. 
and I'm going to try and match that value with white and the cadmium yellow. So let's bring in a bit of that cadmium yellow, and I'm just going to paint it right beside, bring it a little more of that in so the value matches. And then I'm going to ask you the question, which one would you use for sunshine or candlelight? Which one is more intense in color and warmer in color? And you can really see the difference here. Um, so if anyone says to you, you know what, yellow ochre is a warm color, you can tell them now, well, it's actually relative. Okay, that's all. So it's good to know this because uh, a lot of teachers, unfortunately, they, you know, you grab your earth colors, You've got your burnt umbers and your burnt siennas and all those nice warm colors. They all say they're warm colors because they're, you know, earth colors. But in fact, you know, umbers, like a burnt umber is not necessarily a, a warm color. It depends what you put around it. So and burnt sienna, well, that can be pretty warm. There's a fair bit of red or almost like an orangey feel to it. It's like a transparent oxide red. Uh, transparent oxide red is practically orange. It's pretty amazing how warm that is. Um, but if you got, you know, something that, like burnt umber, you would think, well, that's got to be warm because it's burnt. But in fact, that's not really true. All right. So let's do a different color altogether. And I want to give you a sense of how we would work in a refractive way uh, as if this was really something, you know, sitting in, in real light. Um, let's go. I'm going to paint. I did a red ball. Let's do something blue. I guess that would make sense. So I'm going to use uh, cobalt blue and I'm going to put this in cool light. Let's start with that. So this is a nice, rich cobalt blue. It's a beautiful old Holland color. It's just so creamy to work with. I love this color. And again, I call it cool balt because it's just easier to remember. It's cool. And I'm going to just get some nice color going down here. There's so much pigment in this. It's just amazing. Love this color. It's a great color, by the way, if you're making skies. Um, you want a nice, clean sky color. Not above you. That's more towards the ultramarine. But cobalt blue is kind of like, you know, on a 30 degree angle into the sky on a sunny day. And just for fun, I'm going to grab some white here. We're going to go into, oh, I got a little bit of warmth in that from the color I was using before. Uh, it's really important to keep your whites clean. If you wonder why the old artists had like half a dozen brushes in their hands, it's because they wanted to keep their color clean and separate from each other so that when they put the color down, they knew what they were going to get. Uh, so I'm just going to take white and you know really what I should do if I was doing this and I was really you know trying to paint an, a nice looking ball I would take um, the white and I would bring a little bit of blue into that a little bit of that uh, cobalt blue and I would mix the value that I want for the light area ahead of time um, I could just mix it into this because it's oil. But if you're working in acrylic, this is a good way to work. You can pre-mix the colors that you want. And that's something else we have to talk about today is pre-mixing your colors. Can't forget that. Please don't let me forget that. Because that is really the main punch of today's lesson. Okay. I'm going to use that lighter blue here. I want to create, you know, a blue ball that looks like it's sitting in cool light. So you can see how rich that is. And I'm just going to put it up here. 
one of the advantages of mixing it ahead of time like this is you know what the value is and you know it's nice clean color if you want to get a little fussier with this uh, you could take a small brush and just like a clean brush so there's there's nothing in this brush at all uh, no paint and I can just lightly go over the surface very very lightly and continually cleaning off the brush as I go by the way so two or three strokes then go and clean your brush off and the reason for that is because you want to keep see what happened there you want to keep your values in the right place I can go across this this way and I can go across in another direction and gently with again that dry brush it just blends things nicely I'm not going to try and create a super smooth ball here I just want you to get the principle that's all um, I think while I'm at it here I'm just going to clean that edge up a little bit with my palette knife I can either pull the color in or push it out Get my choice with a palette knife I'm at this stage just kind of pushing it in and just following that curve there we go and later on we'll put something behind that so there we go all right now i'm not going to reach for my uh grays or black or anything like that here i've got a cool light and just so I'm I remember that I'm going to put just a little bit of a highlight in it I'm going to mix my blue over here my little highlight and just drop one right there okay now I've got a little highlight and if I'm going to go to uh, if I got cool light I've got warmer shadow I should have a sharpie here to write this down but anyhow we'll just say it's cool light up here and my shadow will be relatively warmer I'm just gonna put that over there so we can remember uh, warm light cool sorry cool light warm shadow even I get confused that's old age all right okay so now I'm gonna take my ultramarine blue which is a warm blue and it happens to be darker than this here so it's a nice rich dark value i can go into that and very quickly get a sense of shadow on this side now i've gone in with a pure ultramarine blue and if it's a good day well that might work but really what i should be doing is neutralizing my color a little bit now neutralizing just means that you're taking away the intensity of the color and taking away the intensity of the color is important in the shadow areas because we do not see um intense color and in shadows unless there's you know a little light shining on it somewhere in the shadows we don't see the intense color so real intense color is the property of light not the property of shadow and we can lose color information in the shadows and we can gray things down in the shadows so i'm going to bring in the complement color of blue which is orange so i'm going to create an orange cool light warm shadow so i'm going to reach to my warm palette to create this orange i'm going to take a bit of cadmium red i'm going to take a little bit of uh, cadmium yellow over here and that's like the complement color to the blue this is a fairly red orange i don't want to get it too light because i'm going to the shadow area and then i'm going to go to my ultramarine 
and I'm going to bring the ultramarine into this. And you don't need very much of the complement color, by the way. You really don't need much. Now you can see that's gone a little bit green. So I need to make sure that I keep the identity of the color in the shadow. That's pretty rich and that's working, but it's not working so well with the cobalt blue. And so I also need to bring in a bit of cobalt blue because that's the original color, right? I don't want to get away from that uh, cobalt blue too much or it won't look right. It's going to look like a cobalt blue light area and an ultramarine area in the shadow. So pretty important that I keep that, uh, that blue consistent. So before I do this next step, because I have a feeling I've got a fair bit of color going there that I'm going to have to turn this into. Uh, grab another palette knife. And I'm just going to very lightly take out some of that color that I have there. And you can see there's a fair bit of color to that. I'm going to take that out, and I'm going to replace it with this color here, which is now a combination of cobalt blue, a bit of ultramarine, that brings it down, and the complement color orange. And let's see what this looks like. Now, it may be hard to tell from where you are. This is on a screen, so I'm not sure how this looks to you. But in real life, as I'm looking at it, it gives me a lot more sense of this proper blue going to shadow. And I'm going to drag some of those lighter colors down. And because I've got the complement color in here now, it's also more neutral. It's not as intense. Now, I could make this a darker blue ball. That's okay. It really depends on what I'm looking at, right? And I'm just going to mix that up there. Let some of these blues come down in here. And you can see how that starts to form a sense of halftone through here. And I've got a ball that's looking a little bit more believable. Okay. Uh, Carl, yeah, an interesting thing. You know, I don't use Prussian blue much. I don't know why. Never really got into it. Um, I do use phthalo blue sometimes, which is super warm. Uh, and cobalt's, yeah, maybe between ultramarine and Prussian. I'd have to look at those lined up. I can't remember the last time I bought Prussian blue. I know there are a lot of artists that use it. So... Um, it's a nice color. I find I work with a very simple palette. Um, you know, this is really my major palette right there. And I can take that anywhere and almost do anything that I want. Maybe what I'm missing is the Thalo family. So it'd be either a Thalo or a manganese or a cerulean blue. Um, they're all in the same family. So, okay. Uh, I'm going to take a brush and just clean up around the outside of this. And let's see if I can make this look a little more like a ball. It might have been easier to paint a box. I don't know. I'm just going to clean this up. I'm hoping that you are finding this informative. Um, you know, as much as it's okay to watch this, uh, it's really important to practice this. You know, you're not gonna get anywhere with color unless you practice it. You just have to do that. You have to put in your painting hours. There's no other way. And if you can paint in nature, I really highly recommend that you get outdoors when you're allowed, or, well, we are allowed as long as we don't get too close to people, I guess, um, even now. So get outside and paint. And you'll see colors in nature and learn is almost an intuitive recognition over time when something is right and it's not. If you've done enough painting outdoors, 
plain air painting. Can't beat it. Not all of us can do it because uh, we can't get out or it's awkward or, you know, I'm teaching in Vienna with a couple of times when some very strange people come up to the students and bother them. You know, we were there as a group, so it was safe. Um, but, um, you know, if you can get into your back garden or a friend's back garden and just paint in real light, make sure uh, if you do that you're sitting in shade, by the way, or you have an umbrella that you can get under because if you paint in direct light, if the direct light is hitting your uh, canvas, you're done. I, I have not been able to get around that. Everything that you paint in that kind of light looks really contrasty and really awful, honestly. It's just, so save yourself from pain and uh, paint in the shadow, looking out towards the light. All right. Okay. Now, I want to kind of create some excitement around that ball. Uh, we've got cool light. Um, maybe it's sitting on a, well, it could be sitting on a, uh, let's see, let's, let's say it's a warmer surface. Uh, I'm going to put it, I'm going to put a yellow in behind it. Now this is going to really look strange because this yellow is so strong and it's warm. Now, if you want it, if you want to create something that's like a poster, you can do that. But because it's cool light, I'm going to grab a little bit of this blue happens to be there, and I'm going to put this in here. And you know, now we're going to get into color harmony. That looks wrong, but this should look more right because we're in cool light, right? So that's actually quite like a light green almost. And if you notice, it's almost an ochre. You can create an ochre with your blue and your yellow if you're careful with it. I want to put a shadow in underneath. Let's grab my yellow ochre and put a darker yellow in underneath it. I have cool light and I should have warm shadow. So this is a case where I want to, I'm going to take a, a darker yellow, which is in my yellow ochre, but now I want to neutralize. If I put that in with its pure intensity, first of all, it's not dark enough. Um, and it's in its pure intensity. So the complement to uh, yellow, if you look at your color wheel, if you want, or if you follow my triangle system, is violet. Okay, so I'm going to mix up. Uh, a lizard crimson because it's darker and a bit of uh, ultramarine blue bring those together and I think I could use a little more blue in here it's just a guess if you want to know what your dark color looks like just add like when it comes into the light you want to know what kind of violet you're getting you have to add some white into to see what that's going to look like. So I'm going to take this violet here and add that to my yellow ochre. I can add a little more. And now what I'm getting, I don't need to get a raw sienna, do I? I can just make my own this way. But it's a colorful dark yellow now. So let's see what that looks like as a shadow. Now I'm showing you a fairly comprehensive way of painting these things, thinking about refraction and how that works. And this is sort of a science-based way of approaching color. Um, I'm going to, before we're done today, I'm going to show you another method it creates color harmony that is very lovely and is a quick way 
I can say that of getting to a result. So now I've got a shadow area that's coming in underneath. Looking at this on the screen, it doesn't look so great. Anyhow, um, I can punch a little bit of that violet in. I'm going to contrast that even more. You can do that. You can take your complement color and you can just chunk it in underneath to get a little darker if you want to. And it gives you the idea. We've got cool. Uh, we've got, really, I can just take yellow ochre if I want to and create a cool light. And it won't be so much towards the cadmium side. And just pop this in here. So we'll at least give you an idea. Okay, so those colors start to look right together. As long as the values are working and the color relationships are right, then you can create something that creates the effect. So I'm getting my practice with a palette knife in here today. Okay. hands probably in the way that we can't see half of what I'm doing. All right. So that gives you an idea, at least. Okay. Oh, yes, Sasha, thank you. All right, pre-mixing colors. Okay, so let's talk about that. Uh, okay, hopefully all of that made sense. You know, you can watch this again. And maybe you'll even find me making mistakes, so that's okay. And we can correct mistakes. But um, watch it again, and this hopefully will make sense, all of this. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I want to show you what pre-mixing colors means. I'm just going to take this here. Um, yeah, I know all leftover paint. By the way, when I'm painting, I do this a lot. When I clean my palette off, I go through all my color with a palette knife and I mix it all into one color, which very often ends up being a very beautiful color that I can use to harmonize my paintings with. Look at what happens when I add white to this. I get this beautiful, cool, bluish gray. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, that could you that could be very helpful in a painting. Um, I don't get rid of all of those colors until I'm done a painting because sometimes those are the colors that I need to sort of tone down colors that are too noisy. And I'll put a little bit of that in here and there in the painting because your grays in your painting are more important than your primary colors. We see mostly grays. Do you know, uh, this is going to sound crazy, and I think I might have said this in an earlier uh, live stream, that everything we look at is a gray that leans towards a primary, and someone, some, some colors actually make it to a primary. So... Uh, I want you to think about that. When you're, you know, painting a scene, here's our mucky scene. As soon as you drop, you know, a pure color into that mucky scene, it shows beautifully. It's absolutely, you know, stunning because you've got these pure colors against all those colors that are neutral and gray. That makes color beautiful because now we suddenly have a relationship. It's sort of like... You know, those two are on stage now. They're at the opera and they're on stage. So, all right. I'm going to clean this palette off a bit because this next stage is important to be clean. Um, a lot of us will, and I include myself, will grab a, a photo or, you know, we'll go out and paint somewhere and we've got 
lots of ambition. We're, you know, the sun's moving, so we want to get right into it. We want to paint that thing that's in front of us, and maybe it's a, a class with a model. And, you know, you've got a limited time. So the first thing we do is we grab all our bright colors, and away we go. We, we get our brushes wet, and, you know, we draw it out as fast as we can, and then we jam the colors in as fast as we can. And maybe our drawing is really good. Uh, you know, maybe even our values are really good. But the problem is, in a lot of cases, the colors are not working. And, you know, we think, oh, man, I need a little more of this color. I need a little more of that color. Before you know it, you just got a great big muddy mess of colors. And none of them are working with each other. They're all sort of, you know, I'm sort of a color. I'm not a color. I'm, I don't know what I am. They all are having an identity crisis. So one thing I really am doing a lot more lately and really, it, I find it makes such a difference, uh, is pre-mixing my colors. And there's some method to this. I'll just show you how this works. And this guarantees color harmony, okay? Um, all right. <laughs> and that's a great question. What's the difference between mud and gray? So, um, Mud can be gray and mud can be brown, as Sasha has mentioned, and mud can be like a blue gray or a blue uh, brown, like a cooler brown. Uh, it can be cooler or warmer, and you know it can be towards the black with a little bit of color in it. So mud, when we think of looking at the earth, uh, it can be so many different colors, and uh, muddy color. Uh, it can be your best friend, too, because that's what makes other colors set up. Maybe that's a, a mud color right there. You, you, you go out and, you know, you see a color like that in the ground somewhere. Maybe it's an old stone or something. But it, that's a muddy color because it's all kinds of colors mixed together. But it's still beautiful in the right place, in context. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to color harmonize. A palette here and show you how this works okay so if I want to make sure that all of my colors are going to harmonize I'm going to start with three primaries and you can do this by the way it doesn't matter how many colors you have down you, you can have like ten colors down and still harmonize your palette but you take one color and that color dominates all of the other colors Okay, so I'm, this is just a, a, a cobalt blue. Um, I'm just going to get that white out of it right there. Keep it clean. I'm going to take some cobalt blue. I'm going to put that there. I'm going to take my alizarin crimson, a little bit there. And I'm going to take my yellow ochre and put it here. All right. Now... I choose which one I want to dominate. In this case, I'm going to go with my yellow ochre. I'm just going to choose that one. So now what I do is I take my yellow ochre and I take a fairly large chunk of it and I'm going to mix it into my alizarin crimson. Now, Old Holland really has a lot of pigment in it. So, um, you know, I can afford to mix in a lot of yellow ochre to make it work. I'm going to put even more in. And you can go like 80% if you want to. I mean, I can go 80% into this on a percentage basis. And I'm going to end up with that color there, which is no longer a lizard red or a lizard crimson. It is a real mix of yellow ochre. And a lizard, a lizard and crimson, which is basically, it would be an orange. If I was mixing, you know, these colors over here, that would be an orange. If I took my yellow and put that much into the red, um, it would be an orange. So that's the kind of orange you would get out of a cool primary palette. Now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take my yellow ochre and I'm going to mix it into my cobalt blue. 
And of course, when I do that, I'm going to end up with a green. It's okay. That's the whole idea here. Um, it's like a blue green. Okay. Cobalt blue is less uh, pigment intense, I would say. Uh, it, it has less strength. It's sort of like one of the weak ones on the team. It's okay. It has its place. So I kept my yellow ochre pure. So you keep one of your colors pure. I'm going to put a little more out here. That's important. Now I'm going to show you something really fun. Uh, no matter what I paint using that primary, this has become my primary palette now. Forget those. This is my primary palette. That's what I'm going to paint with. No matter what I do with those three colors, they are going to be in harmony. And the reason is because they all have a dominant color in. They have, I've chosen this as the dominant color. That color is in the other two. I could have chosen blue and put that into the other two. Um, but I chose the yellow. I could have chosen the red and put that into the other two. The point is that one color is dominant and stays pure. Okay, so I'm now when you start to do things like this, I'm going to take some white. Let's say, I don't know what I'm going to paint. I'm going to paint an abstract. Okay, I'm just going to put my white in to my yellow ochre, which is my dominant color. And then I'm going to, it doesn't matter what other colors I put beside this now. I'm going to take this color that is now a primary color, and I'm going to mix that beside it. And those two colors look nice together. Why? Because they're related now because of the yellow ochre. Now I'm going to take a bit of this green and I'm going to put that in here. And that's interesting. You've got three colors now here that are all related to each other. Um, I'm going to bring in the pure yellow ochre and put that beside it. That's a harmonious palette right there. No matter what you do with those colors, they're going to work. And I'll show you something. I'm going to take these three colors now, and I'm going to mix those together. Remember we were talking about mud? Well, let's see what that looks like. You know, when you mix all your colors together, it's what happens. You end up with mud. Well, I'm going to get a gray. I'm going to put that into here. And that works. If I was painting outdoors, I was trying to create rocks. Um, I might go with a mix like that. I'm going to take these two colors now. I'm going to take this red and this green. And I'm going to create a darker value. And put that up against this one here. And look how beautiful that is right there. I think it's beautiful because it's more subtle. Um, I can take this color here. I can mix a lighter grays if I want. I can bring white into this anytime I want to, by the way. So I can take white into that. That white is also in harmony because it's come from those simple colors there, which all have ochre in them. And those colors would work beautifully for a scene in nature. Uh, I'm, I want to do this palette. How's our time? 329. Okay, because it's a big subject. Let me do one more color harmony palette over here. And let's see what the difference will be. Let me just put in the red. Let me put in the uh, green here. And then I'm going to put in the pure yellow ochre here. And look at the look at the range of colors there. But they're all they are all harmonious. You can't go wrong with color. I I promise that today. Uh, that you will never have to worry about color again if you do this ahead of time. Okay, let's do this next one. Um, I'm going to take my 
cad yellow and then i'm going to take my cad red i don't need much of cad red because it's so strong um the cad red in the old holland it's just like a, a big tube of cad red lasts me two years honestly with uh old holland i'm going to take my blue and last time i used a cool uh yellow to dominate this time let's take uh well, let's take a warm red to dominate. I'm going to put a bit of that into my yellow. I'll keep the red as a dominant color this time. You can see this. Okay, good. All right. This camera is working out better this time. You can actually see what we're doing. That's important. All right. Now I clean off my palette knife. And I put a little bit of that cad red into the ultramarine blue. And again, that cadmium red goes a long way. I'm going to put a little bit more in there. We'll go get some more cad red. So now we have, well, this would be a violet, but this is going to be a very warm violet. Just to show you what that looks like. Can you see that update? Yeah, okay. I'll get a little bit more there so you can see that properly. And that's a warm violet that you get out of it. Okay. And I've kept the red pure. I'm going to put a little more over here so we have some to work with. There we go. All right. Now, it, I'm going to take my white again. I'm going to take this yellow, which has now a bit of cadmium red in it. So it's really, it's like an orange, isn't it? But as soon as I add white to it, it cools it and it lightens it at the same time. That's what it does. Then what I'm going to do is take some white and bring in the cadmium red on its own. And don't need much. And I've got this beautiful pink, which comes from the pure cad red. I need to get a little more white to make this work. There we go. And the reason I'm saying a little more white is because as soon as you add white to a color, you can see the color better. That's all. You can tell what it is. If you look at Monet's paintings, you look at the very lightest areas, you'll see loads of different colors, but they're all in a high key of very light uh, value. And I'm going to take the white. Let's do it over here. I'll take that violet that we ended up with. And now I have a harmonious palette. This is just amazing when you look at it. And like I say, you can do this with it, all your colors. Just take one color, let one dominate. Um, now, when I put these colors together, let's just see what that looks like. Look at the colors I get out of that, even if they're mixed together. It's okay, um, because again, the cadmium red is my dominant color. I can take this color here and put it over here. And that works against that violet. And that really pops out. Saving my purest colors for the smallest areas, because that's what nature does. I can put some of these colors in now. And look how much that jumps against those colors behind. I, if I want darker colors, I can put a darker color in. But the most important color, the dominant color, the one that I really want to say, hey, look at me, is cadmium red. And I don't have to put much of it in. And it says, look at me, I'm standing out. I'm even stronger than those other colors right there. Um, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the birthday girl or boy. So if you mix your colors ahead of time, you pre-mix, make one color dominant, you'll find that you have a beautiful color harmony. And if I just cover this here and look at the difference between this one and this one, you can really see how one is warmer 
and the other is cooler. Okay, you can, I mean, you can really, it, it gets pretty obvious when you look at it this way. Um, there's one other thing that I'm going to point out. If you have a color harmony like this, and, you know, that's very beautiful. It's, it's nice. Um, it's cool. It's not very punchy. You can almost pre-mix or take a color from the other palette, which is a warm palette, and watch what happens when I take that and pop it into this color here. And guess which one ends up getting all the attention. Be careful when you do this. This is something maybe you want a flower to stand out against the background that's cooler. Um, be careful because as soon as you start mixing, when I talk about mud, as soon as I start mixing all those colors together with that color that comes from the other side of the palette, then you end up with a lot of mud, a lot of color that just doesn't harmonize as well. See, that harmonizes. This color does not harmonize. Even though those colors are in this, because I've taken that color there, it's created kind of a yucky color in relationship to those ones there. The color is a very emotional thing. Um, you know, people tend to lean towards either a warmer or a cooler palette. Um, you know, there are certain colors we grow up with that we just really like. And so we end up using those colors a lot. When you start pre-mixing your colors like this, it breaks you into a whole new area of color. And it's really super exciting. What I haven't shown you is, so, I mean, you can extrapolate from this. You can take this a little further. Uh, for example, um, I could take, um, well, let's say my alizarin crimson now and my cadmium red. And they're from opposite primaries, right? And if I use that color to harmonize all of my colors, I can do that as well. So like, you, you know, there's no end to the numbers of ways to harmonize. You can use a secondary color to harmonize your other colors. What happens, for example, if I take this color here and I add it into these other ones here that I into my cool palette, I'm just going to do that. I can still leave that ochre dominant if I want to, and that will that'll still work. But let's take this color into the ochre as well. And let's see what colors we end up with. When you go into a paint store, you'll find these are the kind of colors you see in a paint store because it's easier to look at neutralized colors than it is to look at pure colors. When we're children, we love primary colors. We love these really bright ones. Uh, but now let's have a look and see what kind of color we get when I bring those two together. And you can see, I can see these beautiful grays. I can warm the grays a little bit by taking my ochre. I can warm them even further by taking a bit of that red. So you can see the range of colors is limitless, absolutely limitless. But if you keep them harmonious, start with three primaries um, that are all related to each other, then you'll end up with beautiful, harmonious color through your paintings. Okay, um, we're at 3.39. I try and get these things in in an hour and a half usually. I'm gonna come back to me. Um, yeah, Carl, you're right. I'm just going back through comments. It looks like English red. There is an English red in, in uh, the feel of these colors here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to come back to me here, so the layout. There we go. So that's a lot of information in, in one session. Um, again, go back and listen to it again, if you can stand listening to me again. Um, I've compressed you know, a course into one hour and a half, which is uh, really crazy. There's more to all of this, and you can really fill this out. If you want to know more about color, there's lots of books out there. If you know Richard Schmidt's uh, Alla Prima book, he gets into a lot of color. He doesn't quite take it to this 
extent. He has a fabulous uh, way of explaining his color palette, uh, uh, or his color um, charts, rather. Um, but it's, it's a beginning, because there are literally millions of colors. Um, if yes, thank you, Sasha. If you like this session, please like the, the uh, YouTube uh, uh, video. Um, subscribe if you haven't already, or you know, send this to someone who you think might be interested. The more subscriptions, the better for me. And there's a really big surprise coming up. I mentioned it last week, but I've got a super nice surprise for anyone who has subscribed uh, to my YouTube channel. Um, there's an opportunity for you uh, coming up, and I'm not going to get into the details. This is a teaser um, so that you come back again. I'm trying to learn how to do this better. Um, so uh, any, I'm doing this for free. So anyone who wants to watch, any young people you know who might be interested in learning more about painting and color and whatever we're talking about, it changes from week to week. I'm trying to come back every Friday. So um, thank you for joining today. I'm really thankful that uh, you've shown up. I'm very thankful to be able to do this for you. And, and it also reminds me, it's not just for you, it's for me too. Because sometimes I get kind of mixed up with my colors and my drawing and values. And I do, uh, you know, after some years of painting, um, it's really important to go back to the uh, simple basics and you can be really complicated about painting but you know in the end um, you you know if you end up something that you like to do and something you like to look at and others like to look at then that's a big deal and and you should be doing this for joy and for pleasure yes the technical side is important I think uh, you know if you want to advance as a painter um, but um, uh, do it because you love it. And um, I love doing this and uh, I love sharing what I know about this. Others have been generous with me. So uh, again, thank you so much for showing up today. I really appreciate it. I see some, some familiar names coming up. This is so nice. Uh, Annette, great to see you. And Berndt, uh, thanks for showing Sasha and everyone. Angelica, um, I hope I'll see you back here next week and have a safe and great weekend. I know we're in tough times right now, but uh, we're very fortunate to be able to do what we love in our own spaces. There are some people who don't get to do that and, um, you know, who are putting themselves at risk because they need the money and they're employed and they're essential. So, um, you know, we're thinking about these people too. Be well, be safe, and happy painting. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.